Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Is there any room in U.S. politics for a candidate who's running against both the Republican and the Democratic parties and wants to stand up for the working class? Let's get to the bottom line. It's hard to imagine a presidential candidate in the United States who's not impressed with any of the major political parties, who wants to stand up for racial equality and the working class, and wants to sort of unplug the military-industrial complex. But that's exactly what my guest today is doing. He is Dr. Cornell West, one of America's most prominent scholars and activists, the author of more than a dozen books, who's taught at some of the top universities in the United States, including Yale, Princeton, and Harvard. And he's a professor of philosophy at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Dr. West, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show again. And let me just start out. You have launched a, a, a bid to seek the nomination as the Green Party candidate for president of the United States running in 2024. I'm going to start out. People are worried about the impact you have. I want to know why you're running. What do you want to bring to this race and to the national conversation? Well, I appreciate you having me, my dear brother. But no, I've tried to be true to my calling, which is the quest for truth. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak and the quest for justice. And justice is what love looks like in public. And so the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, Edward Zaid, and Dorothy Day and Fannie Lou Hamer, all of these are when at my back as I spill over into the electoral political system. You see, the American empire is in very deep internal decay and external decline. And for me, I want to put the focus on those friends for known called the wretched of the earth, the precious poor people, precious working people here and abroad, no matter what color, no matter what gender, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what religious identity. So it's a question of raising my voice and showing the ways in which big money and corporate wealth has completely dominated both parties, and neither party can speak to the plight and the predicament of poor and working people here and abroad, the militarism abroad on the one hand, and the internal grotesque wealth inequality within the American empire. You know, when, when uh, President Biden ran against uh, Donald Trump and won the presidency, black Americans delivered that win for him. Uh, it's just absolutely clear that, that black Americans uh, who, who basically lag uh, in wealth, they are victims of mass incarceration in, in American society. You have lots of problems that have been, been anchoring, you know, the story of black Americans. But they delivered Joe Biden to the presidency. Do you believe they should be satisfied with Joe Biden's performance? Oh, not at all. I mean, uh, uh, one, the poverty has increased. He, he did cut child poverty in half during the pandemic, but the law expired and the child poverty went right back up again. So it showed there's no deep commitment to trying to reduce child poverty. I'm calling for the abolition of poverty. I'm calling for living wages. I'm calling for strong defense of trade union movements. I'm calling for decarbonizing the air. And most importantly, I'm calling for what Biden has very much fought for. He fights for the expansion of the military budget and the expansion of militaristic policies abroad. I'm calling for the demilitarizing of U.S. foreign policy, the demilitarizing of U.S. imperial policy. So we have a major major clash. And I've got to convince not just black Americans, I've got to convince my fellow Americans across the board that militarizing abroad is leading toward possible nuclear exchange. Militarizing abroad is taking away valuable resources that should be invested in health care, in ho decent housing, quality education, and in increasing the quality of the relations in the country. You see, we, the violence, the polarization, the gangsterization of American culture is a very sad thing to witness, my brother. And that has much to do with the lack of serious leadership in the White House, be it the Republican Party tied toward neo-fascism, exemplified by Trump, or Biden tied by very much mediocre, milquetoast neoliberalism, exemplified by Biden. You know, Dr. West, I've, I think I've read um, all of your speeches uh, uh, in the last few years, and I was frankly kind of surprised to see your willingness to run 
for the nomination of the Green Party and to run for president because it's kind of a comment that you're playing by the rules of the system, that you're going to run for office within the boundaries of how electoral politics is done. You're running against the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. But I always saw you as someone who's basically saying this system is rigged, and it's rigged against uh, the people you're trying to represent. I'd love to understand that tension because it's an interesting comment that of all people running in this way, you're running in the system, sort of against the system. Yeah, that's a wonderful point, though. And in all honesty, I surprised myself. <laughs> in all honesty, I surprised my magnificent wife, Anahita Madavi West. Why? Because I've always viewed myself as part of a prophetic tradition that brings critique to bear on unjust status quo and tries to empower poor and working people wherever they are. But what has happened in the last couple of years is that we haven't had voices on the inside that have in any way tried to speak to poor and working people. So I decided to do what? Become head of the American empire in order to dismantle the American empire and empower poor and working people around the world in my candidacy, my brother. It's just a moment in a larger global movement, increasing voices from around the world, every corner of the globe, calling for policies that would accent their dignity. And so in that sense, it's quite continuous with my own prophetic sensibility. It's just that you're right. Now I'm going inside in order to dismantle to ensure that those resources available there can be made much more available to poor and working people. How do you feel your message is being heard? You know, I remember, you know, 20 years ago, I worked closely and professionally with Dr. Chalmers Johnson. Chal Chalmers wrote yes. the book called Blowback, The Costs and Consequences of American Empire. It became the toughest to get book after uh, the Iraq uh, war, the, our invasion of Iraq occurred. Um, and he made similar arguments, and, and, and he was a powerful white scholar from UC Berkeley who had moved to UC San Diego, commenting that the tensions about American militarism and American military engagement were going to chew up our, uh, the fabric of society internally. And I'm interested in, in your own observations about that and, and how you get from where we are today to the kind of world where you think there's going to be much more justice and equity. Because it seems to me, if you're right, it's going to be a horribly messy process. Well, one, it's already messy in terms of the deaths that could be on the West Bank, where you've got so many precious Palestinians being crushed by barbaric Israeli defense forces. And yet, at the same time, you've got peasants in Brazil. At the same time, you've got workers in Uganda. At the same time, You've got Dalits in India or Muslims in China who are not being treated right. And it's just a matter of trying to not hate anybody, but to hate injustice. Chalmers Johnson was a great truth teller. He was cutting radically against the grain. He was cutting radically against those scholars who were coming up with rationalizations of American imperial power. So he became a prophetic figure, very much like C. Wright Mills or W.B. Du Bois or Tony Morrison trying to tell the truth, but it's already messy. It's already ugly. It's already violent. The question is, how do we come to terms with that messiness, that violence in such a way that we can accent the best in each and every one of us? I recent li uh, listened recently to an interview you did with the Black Agenda Report, which I found very, very interesting and illuminating. And one of the other surprises for me in that was your uh, enthusiasm, frankly, for wanting to go into Trump country uh, and your thought that there will be a lot of Trumpists that are now kind of engaged with President Trump who may find your message very compelling. Tell us more. Well, one, of course, one out of 10 of the supporters of Donald Trump actually supported my very dear brother, Bernie Sanders. You mm -hmm. know, I supported Bernie Sanders twice, 2016, 2020, and he had the same critique of Wall Street that I had. He didn't have the same critique of the Pentagon that I have. But he's very progressive, mm. and it means then that those who support Trump, you know, they're not stereotypes. They're human beings who are deeply wounded, deeply pushed against the wall economically, but they choose to follow a neo-fascist Pied Piper rather than understand their condition 
in such a way that it creates a class solidarity across race and across regions. So I'm going straight into Trump country and try to convince them that their major political foes actually are the one percent echoes of the Occupy movement. And you know, of course, three individuals in the United States have wealth equivalent to the bottom 50 percent of Americans. That's 160 million. And the top 1% have wealth equivalent to the bottom 90%. So 60% of Americans are struggling every day to survive, and it, yet it's the richest nation in the history of the world, and yet it's got military expenditures that are more than the next 10 countries come by, and it's got 800 military units all around the world for its empire. And there's no way. That, that poor and, and working people can be in, empowered given this kind of arrangement of an empire. So that's where the real effort needs to be. The truth-telling on the one hand, the organizing on the other, and then trying to do it in the spirit of love, though. Brother. This, and this is the, the challenge, you know what I mean? That's the real challenge. How do you talk about Israeli-Palestinian situation without trashing Jewish brothers and sisters? I have no... Time for any anti-Jewish hatred. I only have time for affirming Palestinian dignity and affirming Jewish security. But Jewish security does not go hand in hand with an Israeli occupation. There will never be Jewish security with an Israeli occupation and domination of Palestinians. How do we engage in this in such a way that we get beyond hatred and revenge, but put love and put justice, and most importantly, put the suffering of the least of these. As you know, I'm a revolutionary Christian, so the 25th chapter of Matthew means much to me. What you do to the least of these, the poor, the oppressed, the subjugated, you do unto me. I take that very ser seriously in terms of a calling. But you also have the first woman of color essentially in the White House as vice president of the United States. And so I'm just asking, has she delivered for the communities you're talking about? I mean, I'm interested in your view because a lot of people point to Kamala Harris and they say that's a sign of success. Does it feel like a sign of success? Well, no. I mean, the same thing was true with Obama when we had a black president. You had a black president, you had a black attorney general, you had black homeland security, but you got a black lives movement. Why you had militarized police departments, just like you got militarized apartheid-like conditions on the West Bank and Gaza, that the uh, uh, presence of a black face in a high place symbolically shows a certain breakthrough, but substantially doesn't mean too much if they don't have the courage to critique the status quo that they're a part of. And so Kamala Harris, just reached this last year or so, uh, when Biden was asked whether America was a racist society, he said no. And they asked her, is America a racist society? She said no. So she's just following her boss. She's not interested in truth. As I said before, if you, if you can't allow the suffering to speak, you're not speaking truth. We got mass incarceration. My God, 25% of all incarcerated people in the world are the United States. Most of them black and brown. Deeply, deeply white supremacists in that way, an extension in many ways of the slavery of 244 years in the Western Hemisphere and, and Jim Crow and Jane Crow another 100 years. So you have to be free enough to speak the truth, not in the spirit of self-righteousness, but in a spirit of self-critical, tenacious, commitment to the overcoming the plight and predicament of foreign working people around the world. It reminds me of Ida B. Wells Barnett. That's my tradition. It's a great tradition of a black people that says in the face of terror, we don't terrorize back. We want liberty for everybody, but we will fight. In the face of hatred, we will still love truth and beauty and justice and organize in order to attempt to overcome in the face of trauma will be wounded healers rather than wounded herders. That's the great tradition of struggle for black freedom in the United States. And this campaign is just a small wave in that great ocean mm -hmm. of that grand tradition, my brother. In your campaign launch video, Dr. West, you, you reference your concern about the destruction of American democracy. I'd love to hear more. What is driving that destruction of American democracy from your view? Well, we've got neo-fascism escalating. What is neo-fascism? It is a rule of big military, big money, with political leaders who convince a relatively helpless citizenry that they should scapegoat the most vulnerable, indigenous people, black people, Muslim, 
Arabs, immigrants, Jews, any group that historically has been degraded. And that's precisely what Trump does. And you cannot have a democracy with the rule of big money, with grotesque wealth inequality, with hardly a public sphere, which means everything is commodified, ends up being militarized, ends up being privatized. So there's no public spaces where people can come together and engage in critical reflection. It's simply gangsterized, simply polarized. And the result is what? Tyranny, increasing tyranny. That's what we're seeing in the United States. And that's why it's so important to keep alive the great legacies of Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, and others. You know, next week, the Supreme Court is supposed to rule on affirmative action. And I'm interested if they strike down affirmative action. Um, do you worry about that? Or is that basically a small measure when it comes to the level of systemic change you're advocating? Yeah, I mean, my expectation is they certainly will. Uh, they'd already diluted it down to very narrow conceptions of diversity. It no longer has anything to do with the kind of call for reparations that are needed in order to begin to deal with the damage done of slavery and Jim Crow and Jane Crow and other forms of domination. So I'm, my hunch is they certainly will eliminate affirmative action, and we simply have to continue our struggle and try to come up with ways in which black people, but not just black people, but brown people, not just brown people, indigenous people, not just indigenous people, but poor people across the board have ways in which they gain access to resources and dignity. So we simply have to shift in strategies that my brother, the Supreme Court, deeply conservative, deeply right wing for the most part. As you look at the campaign that's coming ahead, I'm really interested in the Green Party, the People's Party, and, you know, many people discount that you have any chance at all of winning. But what I've been able to tell them is that your voice is going to be heard. You're going to be out there critiquing. But how, what is your national strategy um, politically as you kind of begin this effort, which you launched on June 5th? As you look at the country, how are you going to try and turn someone who's a skeptic of your candidacy into someone who understands what you're doing? Well, first, though, you know, the political discourse in America has been so narrow hmm. that most fellow citizens haven't even been exposed to the kind of vision and analysis that I have. So that it's going to be a real uh, breath of fresh air, I hope, that they can see that somebody is concerned about taboo issues that they hardly get a chance to talk about. Look at the Ukrainian war. There's no serious understanding of the impact of the expansion of NATO and the United States violating its promise that NATO would not move one inch toward Russia. Americans know that if there were missiles in Canada or Mexico and Russian missiles in Canada and Mexico, U.S. empire would blow them into smithereens. They would never allow it. We saw this in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Well, that's how empires behave. There's no doubt about that. Now, Russia, we know, has its own domination and oppression, but it is a small empire compared to the United States. And so just to have an analysis of ceasefire, stop the war, stop the suffering of our precious Ukrainian brothers and sisters, but understand that NATO historically and is today a arm of U.S. global power. And therefore, it is in no way neutral. It is in no way to be trusted in terms of telling the truth. Most Americans hardly even gain access to that view. They will now in this campaign, because I'll raise that issue over and over again. Same will be true in the Middle East in terms of the Palestinian situation. Same will be true with, with, when it comes to what's happening in Latin America vis-a-vis -vis U.S. imperial power. And certainly that will be the case in terms of the mass incarceration the decrepit schools, indecent housing, unavailable health care for poor black, poor brown, poor white, and others in the richest empire in the history of the world. Dr. West, from the moment you launched your campaign, the headlines uh, about your campaign launch were Cornell West, spoiler for Biden. I'd, I'm fascinated by the commentary that sort of you know, tries to support the, 
the lock that two political parties have in the U.S. political system and the, the immediate enmity of a third party that comes in. I'd love to hear from you uh, and tell those people who have that criticism and see you as a potential spoiler for Joe Biden how you view democracy a little differently. I mean, it's fascinating to me that those who are, on the one hand, supposed to be committed to democracy are so interested in excluding a variety of different voices, especially when those voices are highly critical of unjust status quo. Uh, the idea that we could have a political discourse in the United States at this moment with no serious talk about destruction of the planet, let alone destruction of democracy, with no serious talk about the redistribution of wealth downward as opposed to where it is now going upward, with no serious talk about the issues of class and how it relates to issues of race and gender, let alone how it relates to imperial foreign policy. Mm. So, so it shows, in fact, that our, our political elites, they're not interested in democracy in any substantive way, a democratic, robust conversation about power, status, justice, and a vision for a better future? Not at all. They've got mechanisms of censorship. They've got mechanisms of exclusion. And to say I'm a spoiler is to say what? That Joseph Biden, that he owns votes? That people can't think for themselves? That people can't be Socratic and reach positions that are outside of the mainstream? How sad. Let me ask you finally, Dr. West, what would day one of a Cornell West presidency look like? Well, I've told my beloved wife, I said, you know, uh, if and when I win, I'm not even going to move into the White House until everyone has a house. That the first day is going to be one in which a paradigm shift has taken place. The first day is one in which we're going to begin the demilitarizing of U.S. foreign policy, the the, the, the pullback of all the military troops in too many places is going to be one in which Wall Street and Pentagon and Silicon Valley elites will begin to tremble because we'll cast a light on their organized greed, not in the spirit of hatred. It's like Jesus in the temple. And I'm no Jesus, but Jesus in the temple ran out the money changers, not because he hated the rich. He hated greed. And this campaign is about a hatred, not of persons, of greed a hatred of injustice, that will be the spirit of a West administration. And I was just going to say, I'll pardon Julian Assange and Snowden and Mumia Abu-Jamal and a whole host of political prisoners. That's what I was going to say, my brother. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cornell West. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, man. So what's the bottom line? The voice of this American philosopher is going to become a significant part of the national conversation about America's next leader and what that leader should stand for and try to accomplish. This election was already bound to be interesting, but with Dr. Cornell West in the race, there's going to be someone with a national megaphone shaming a system that has little concern for those living in poverty who've been victims of mass incarceration. No matter who the Democratic and Republican nominees for president are, and even though I don't think Dr. West has a snowball's chance in hell of winning, they will have to respond to his critiques and challenges. And that's going to be a win for many who have never had the chance to win. And that's the bottom line.